Well, you are ready? Yeah. Thank you very much. Now I have, I think, 15 minutes. I don't know how I'm going to present 35 slides in 15 minutes. Probably I will not be able to do it. <laughs> this is my conflict of interest. Basically, we have about 30 publications, out of which 25 are with, with no support. So I call supporters to come and support us. The cigarette phenomenon is a consumer-initiated and driven phenomenon and product. It was not developed by the medical science or the pharma industry. It is a product which is much more complicated than tobacco cigarettes, and most people don't, haven't realized that. Uh, basically dealing with chemistry, electronics, they are completely different in the mode of function and the characteristics and even the patterns of use from consumers who were basically 99% former smokers or smokers. So many scientists with experience in tobacco research think that they are competent to perform research on e-cigarettes, but are they? We, I'll start with a recent review on uh, Nature Reviews of Cancer uh, by Sergei Grando in which he presented the connections between nicotine and cancer. You know that nicotine is not currently classified as a carcinogenic substance, but the IARC has considered the priority to re-evaluate that. It's uh, quite a coincidence that this is happening now that this cigarette use is growing. Now, this uh, review had 199, uh, 191 references about the carcinogenic effects of nicotine, not one epidemiological study of humans. And uh, interestingly, although you see the title is about nicotine and cancer, already at the second paragraph of the manuscript, there was a whole discussion about e-cigarettes. This is one of the parts initially that they mentioned, that uh, as you can see, they said that they used uh, mice and they injected subcutaneously dose of nicotine to reproduce uh, the dose uh, consumed by regular Scandinavian SNAS users. And of course, they found some leo leomyosarcomas and so on. However, the interesting point is that the level of nicotine that they used in order to uh, imitate the use by uh, humans was three milligrams per kilogram, which was also the lethal dose 50% <laughs> of the animals. So 50% of the animals died. So you understand that there is a big... Um, uh, big discrepancy between what you are doing in mice and what, what's happening in humans. Uh, the dose that was needed to create cotton in level similar to a snooze user was lethal for 50% of the mice. Of course, we know that we don't have a mortality rate of 50% in uh, Scandinavian snooze users just because of the nicotine levels. Um, another study evaluated from, from Korea a very important study which evaluated uh, tobacco-specific nitrosamines in e-liquids. And it was very interesting because although they found ridiculous levels of nitrosamines, 86.92 micrograms per liter, so we're talking about nanograms per milliliter of e-liquid, and that was not the average, the average was about 12, that was the highest, but look at how they interpreted the study. They said that, okay, we tested 105 liquids from 11 companies, the highest level we found, so that was their problem, the highest, not the average of the 105, was this one. And you know what? That was 10 times higher than a previous publication two years ago by Laugesen from the Ruyan e-cigarette uh, product. Well, uh, we thought that that's a very funny way of interpreting the results of this important study. So we submitted uh, a letter uh, to the journal, and we said that what you really found is that the average is 44 nanograms per day, considering an average use of three to four milliliters per day, which is about 76 to 142 times lower compared to exposure from one tobacco cigarette. And that's the important thing, that's the way this study should have been interpreted. Who cares if the maximum uh, finding was five or six or 10 times higher than another finding of a single product, you know, two years ago? It doesn't make sense. But, you know, they are free to do whatever they want. Uh, you know this, I'm sure everyone. It has been headline news everywhere, formaldehyde in e-cigarette aerosols. Um, it was just a research letter, but it was, you know, the first story about e-cigarettes being so carcinogenic that it is really amazing. So the, um, they tested an e-liquid with an e-cigarette at 3 volts and at 5 volts. And they found that 
a huge risk of cancer of nine, <laughs> of 0 0.0009. <laughs> it's completely ridiculous if you consider that one out of two smokers die from smoking-related disease. But the most important thing that every journalist reproduced was that the risk was five times higher to 15 times higher compared to smoking. And of course, they presented this very, very elegant graph with uh, bars and, uh, and error bars, comparing cigarettes with e-cigarettes. But what's the interesting thing, reading the legend uh, of, the, of, the, of, of the figure, is that, first of all, they didn't even find formaldehyde. They found only formaldehyde hemiacetal. But they assumed that it's the same thing, which we know it's not. Then, for e-cigarettes, for tobacco cigarettes, they used two studies in which they presented the results as mean and standard deviation. However, for the e-cigarettes, they presented the results with standard error of mean. And there is a very important reason for doing that. It's because it would have been impossible for them to present what the standard deviation was. Because out of the 30 tests that they did, you can very easily, using a simple mathematical equation, measure the standard deviation from the standard error of mean, if you know the number of samples, and they mentioned that they had 10 successive samples uh, at three different uh, concentrations, so it's 30 samples. And this is the standard deviation. So as you can see, it would look completely ridiculous presenting a bar uh, a graph with a standard deviation going below zero and at levels which are extremely high. It shows that the, they had a very huge variability between different measurements. And, um, you know, I, I would worry about my methodology if I had such a huge, you know, variability in, in 30 measurements. And, of course, it is questionable whether uh, this these levels are uh, statistically significantly different from these levels with such a standard deviation. Of course, the authors had absolutely no idea, have never heard about the dry puff phenomenon, which uh, if someone is a vapor, he, he knows it, 100% of the vapors know it. Although we first uh, reported the, 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 the occurrence and we explained what the dry puff phenomenon was in 2013, in our first toxicity study, we dedicated a whole paragraph discussing what the dry puff phenomenon is, how it occurs, and how you can avoid this phenomenon. One paragraph. We went back again in 2013, and we had another presentation of the dry puff phenomenon, in which not only, not only we presented what happened, but we also mentioned that our initial choice of, of, of uh, e-cigarette atomizer in that study, which was a puffing topography study, was abandoned because of this dry puff phenomenon. Because every vapor with, who came in the first uh, couple of days told us they, that they could not vape uh, ad lib with the device they were giving them because the device generated dry puffs. So in reality, the dry puff phenomenon was the reason of abandoning the initial choice of the e-cigarette atomizer and using a different atomizer for that study. And we had to discard all the recordings done with the first choice. So the researchers need to know that. So what we did initially after the study published by Jensen was we tried to evaluate the equipment used in the New England Journal of Medicine study. I personally contacted uh, Jensen and he told me that he used a CE4 atomizer at 2.1 ohms and an Inokin device going from 3 to 7 uh, to 5 volts. So we obtained 10 such C4 cartomizers from an e-cigarette company in the UK. I couldn't find it in Greece. They, they, they didn't have C4 atomizers for the past two years. Uh, we asked 10 vapors to come to, 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 to our clinic and to use these atomizers with their own liquids at gradually increasing voltage levels starting from 3 volts. So all vapors all 10 vapors identified dry puffs and stopped using the device at 3.6 to 3.8 volts, which was about 6.1 to 6.8 watts, compared to the 5 volts, which was 12 watts, used in the New England Journal of Medicine study. So basically, the New England Journal of Medicine study probably uh, uh, overburned and uh, liquefied the contents of the atomizer. 
subsequently, we did a study in which we evaluated uh, not only formaldehyde but also other aldehydes in the aerosol, but we differentiated between normal vaping conditions and dry puffs. And we did that by taking um, two uh, atomizers which were identical, but we used a different set setup of the coil and the wick. On one we had a dual wick setup with much more coil, uh, so that we would have much more liquid at the surface area where the um, uh, evaporation occurs. And with the other one, we used a single wick setup with uh, less coil, so it would be more prone to dry puffs. And uh, when we asked seven vapors, we then verified that with the further five uh, vapors uh, to tell us when, when do they feel the dry puffs, they at different power levels. With the less efficient atomizer, uh, they identified dry puffs at 9 and 10 watts while with the other atomizer at, at any power levels they didn't identify any dry puffs they could vape it normally. And as you can see, when the conditions are normal, there are minimal changes in formaldehyde and also acetaldehyde or uh, acetone basically non-existent and acrolein. However, when you generate dry puffs, we basically verified what the New England Journal of Medicine found, study found, that you have a huge elevation in uh, formaldehyde levels, but at conditions at which no vapor is basically exposed. And that's what's important. Uh, there has been a lot of discussion about metals emitted to the aerosol of e-cigarettes. Uh, basically, it's an expected finding. The e-cigarettes are metallic structures. Um, metals and heavy metals are common contaminants in water, in food, and even in inhalational uh, medical product, medicinal products, and in fact, the U.S. Pharmacopeia has um, defined the maximum acceptable daily intake from inhalational medications. Uh, and of course, it's the amount of a compound that defines the toxicity, not its mere presence um, anywhere. So, uh, a very famous study by uh, the Talbot Group from the U.S., which of course tested only one product. Um, they released a table which was impressive in terms of the adverse effects coming from all these metals. They were discussing about leukemia, you will find uh, central nervous system damage, kidney damage. Um, uh, you can find whatever you want here, it's, it's not very, uh, uh, the letters are very small to see, but uh, the problem is that uh, we thought that, you know, th these health effects are too much for the levels they found. I mean, in most cases, they were uh, less than micrograms per 10 puffs, nanograms or even, even less than nanograms. Uh, so uh, what we did was uh, we tried to assess the findings from this study as well as from another study from Gonievich um, and do a risk assessment analysis based on common regulatory limits for exposure to these metals, basically from occupational setting, but also from medications. So what we found for some of the metals, we have a much bigger table, but it didn't fit the slide, is as you can see that the, level, the ratio between the regulatory limits and the levels present in the e-cigarette were on average from two times up to, what, 800 times uh, lower in e-cigarettes compared to the regulatory standards either for medications so the first until nickel, these are the uh, permissible daily exposure limits for f coming from the US pharmacopoeia. And the others are the minimal risk levels and the um, uh, recommended exposure limits from NIOS. Huge differences, we found up to 70,000 times uh, lower levels compared to what is acceptable as an occupational uh, exposure. Uh, so basically, we concluded that, okay, you have a lot of metals, but this, this, this table and the health effects is, are completely irrelevant to the level of exposure. They can happen, but if you work in a mining industry and you are exposed to huge levels of these metals. Um, very recently, last year I think it was, the ASRAE, which is the American Association of Heating, Refrigeration, and Air Conditioning, and probably now e-cigarette engineering, released for some reason which I don't understand, they released a report about the hazards of e-cigarettes. I don't know why no one is going to, I suppose, vape inside the fridge, or 
below their condition, I don't know. Uh, it was very, very well presented in the Stanton Glantz blog. Um, what was the study conclusion from their risk assessment analysis? They said that they emit harmful chemicals into the air, they must be regulated as tobacco products, nitrosamines are carcinogens, formaldehyde is a toxic substance, and so on and so on. But if you look at the study assumptions, it was very, very interesting that they did the following assumptions. For the direct exposure assessment, so the exposure of a vapor who is using the device, they assumed that the respiratory absorption of the inhaled vapor was 100%. So you absorb everything, nothing comes out. We pretend that we don't see any vapor being exhaled. For the indirect passive exposure, it was much more interesting, the assumption. They assumed that everything that you inhale is exhaled at the same time now, in the same study, they took these two assumptions. So that a vapor exhales 100% of what it inhales, and the bystander inhales and absorbs 100%. Of the, of, the, of the aerosol. And these were the two assumptions presented in the same study, evaluating the risk assessment coming from ASRAE. And believe it or not, the study has been peer-reviewed and published one month ago in the Building and Environment Journal. I've never heard of it, but it must be a credible journal. It's completely unbelievable. I don't want to say anything else. Cells and animal studies have recently, as you know, become a trend. Uh, unfortunately, in my opinion, in, mo in most cases, the information is completely irrelevant to human effects. They usually overdose with so much nicotine that whatever you used instead of nicotine, you would have similar effects. And we're talking about milligrams per milliliter, and we know that humans have nanograms per milliliter in their blood. Uh, in 99% of the cases, they don't compare the effects with smoking, but only with clean air. Uh, they don't evaluate smoking cessation because we know that these cigarettes are not good for a non-smoker. Do, we don't have to research that. We don't recommend it to non-smokers. But they don't evaluate smoking cessation with all these studies. And they, concerning animals, they use non-smoking animals, and of course, they compare them with clean air. So in many cases, the conclusions are completely misleading and uninformative. And I'll give you some uh, characteristic ideas. That was a study by a German group. Uh, they evaluated the effects in uh, primary human bronchial epithelial cells. Uh, they, did, they exposed the cells to 200 cigarette puffs with a 10 second interpuff interval. I don't know where they got the time to be able to produce the aerosol and then start redoing a second puff. Anyway, um, they found some effects, of course, compared to clean air. As you can see, uh, interestingly, they found that uh, the e-cigarette aerosol was, was uh, less problematic than glycerol itself. And of course, this, the tobacco cigarette was much worse. But, um, you know, uh, the, why did they find that glycerol, pure glycerol, is more toxic than the e-cigarette? In my opinion, what they did was that they used the undiluted glycerol, which we know has a very high viscosity and is very problematic to supply the wick with this glycerol. And though, so most probably, considering also the very short interpuff interval, they had overheating. However, the main study conclusion is interesting that the results clearly demonstrate that these cigarettes have toxicologic effects. So I asked the author, the main author, in an email, why did you use 200 puffs and not 100 or 500 puffs? And she told me that we use 200 puffs in order to generate a response, which means in order to have a toxicity. So if you have the criterion of exposing something is to, to have, to show some toxicity, how can you say that this is toxic? I mean, that's what you are trying to do. So you, you're not doing the study to see if it's toxic. You are doing the study to produce toxicity. So you cannot, I mean, conclude that, oh, we observe toxicity. No, we caused the toxicity. We didn't observe it. So I don't understand how can you make this, <laughs> this statement because based on what they did, basically they can use whatever chemical they want and they will find the relevant concentration of uh, the level of exposure that is going to be toxic, even water. So it doesn't make sense. That's why uh, it's useless to evaluate studies in which the protocols have been designed by the researchers themselves without having any validation, without being used you know, in any regulatory process. For example, 
The ISO 10993-5 uh, protocol, which we have used in our toxicity studies, have a predetermined level of exposure, which is 1% extract concentration, and they also define what, mean, what toxicity means, which is less than 70% survival compared to controls. And that's how you may get some information. Otherwise, you know, it's, all these conclusions are completely arbitrary because uh, the level of exposure is arbitrary and based on what the researcher decides. What you define as toxicity, again, is not predetermined by anyone. It's just what, what I can decide. So you, you cannot get any valuable conclusions from that. Recently, there was a very, uh, another impressive study from an impressive title journal, American Journal of Physiology, Lung, Cellular and Molecular Physiology, you know, and a very impressive title, Endothelial Disruptive Pro-Inflammatory Effects, Nicotine, and so on, and so on. So, nicotine exposure in human lung microvascular cells. What you see here as a concentration in micro M is basically uh, 16 milligrams up to uh, 1,600 milligrams per liter nicotine concentration. And as you can see, they only found the difference between uh, the control and the highest level of nicotine. All these uh, were not statistically different from the control. Uh, now, the nicotine concentration in blood where the endothelial cells are exposed is 0 0.03 milligrams. So even, okay, uh, I mean, I cannot even do the mathematics, uh, the comparison between 0 0.03 and 1600 milligrams. It's, you know, 100,000 times, 200,000 times more. But, you know, it shows the, how uh, the cells are treated uh, on, on isolated cultures and how easy it is, you know, using such high concentrations, you can use whatever you want and you will find, even if you use vitamins, you will probably find that they are toxic because the levels that they are using is, are, are thousands of times higher than what the human is exposed to. Um, another study, very, very, very interesting, in PLOS-1. PLOS-1 is publishing a lot of studies on, on e-cigarettes. Again, about toxicity, oxidative stress, inflammatory response. Um, so the, the, the authors defined as a dripping atomizer. What they did was they took a clearomizer, they basically uh, removed uh, all the covering, they exposed the wick, and they said that this is a dripping atomizer. They, 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 they then uh, introduced two drops into the wick. They were activating the, the, the e-cigarette and they were measuring, you know, all kind of evil things. Uh, but they said that dripping is dangerous. That's what they said. Well, have a look at what a dripping device is. It has absolutely nothing to do with This is a full of um, metal coil. You can see it very well here. It's full of cotton wick. It's very, very wet. And it has nothing to do with this piece of nothing, basically. So this is a dripping device. This is, you know, uh, an exposed uh, atomizer head from a clearomizer. This should have asked some vapors to understand what's a dripping device. Um, another very interesting study conclusion from, a, from a, an animal study. Uh, they, the authors concluded that e-cigarette exposure results in immuno, immunomodulatory effects that are similar to those observed after exposure to cigarette smoke, but they didn't test cigarette smoke, but they thought that they are similar. And they said, since bacterial and viral exacerbations are major drivers in COPD disease progression, they think that COPD patients who switch from cigarettes to e-cigarettes may not observe any improvement. Well, interestingly, the bacterial and viral exacerbations which are common in COPD patients, they are spontaneous infections. In the study, they didn't evaluate spontaneous infections. They introduced bacteria and, 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 uh, and influenza virus, if I remember well, uh, to the animals. The, the, the researchers did that. So they created the infection and they were just looking at the recovery or the death rate. And of course, they are discussing about COPD patients who switch from cigarettes to e-cigarettes, but there was no switching in their mouse models. They were other healthy non-smoking animals, other using e-cigarettes or clean air. There was no switching from smoking to e-cigarette use. So I haven't seen a study uh, 
evaluating what's happening in real life. In real life, the e-cigarette users are smokers who either become dual users or completely switch. So it would have been very easy for a protocol to take some animals, expose them to cigarette smoke for a, for a period of a few weeks, then uh, randomize the group into half of the animals being exposed to e-cigarette only, and the other half being continuously exposed to smoking. That's how you are going to assess what's happening. Okay, let's say we're going to assess in mice what's happening to someone who switches from smoking to e-cigarette use. I, I consider all these studies completely irrelevant, misinformative and misleading, and of course they are producing headline news about the toxic effects of e-cigarettes. Uh, of course, you have no information about what's happening in a COPD patient who switches. Uh, last but not least, no, it's one before the last, is the famous lipoid pneumonia, and I see many researchers reproducing still this, this stupid uh, argument that lipoid pneumonia, which is a condition associated with the inhalation of lipid substances, is caused by glycerol. Because glycerol, you know, looks oily when you see it. Uh, it stains a lot the clothes, so be careful. There was also some headline news in Spain, which resulted in the complete destruction of the cigarette market, and more than 80% of vapors quit vaping and went back to smoking in Spain. However, we know from secondary school chemistry that glycerol is not a lipid, it's an alcohol. So basically, it's impossible for glycerol itself to cause lipoid pneumonia. Perhaps if you're using a flavoring which is dissolved in lipids, uh, in vegetable oil, for example, uh, that may cause uh, lipoid pneumonia, but not glycerol. Glycerol is completely irrelevant. Um, finally, our friends from UCSF, I have only one. I could have another presentation just with what they have said. But I, I'm finishing with this. It's only one. And it's the famous study on Korean adolescents in which uh, they also released the press statement from the university. So look what's hap what happened in that study. The percent of ever e-cigarette only users, people who, who haven't smoked, was 1.4%. The total number of cigarette users was 18.3 plus 8, which were the dual users, 26.3%. So 1.4 is cigarette use in never smokers versus 26.3%. And the conclusion from this study is that we are witnessing the beginning of a new phase of the nicotine epidemic and the new route to nicotine addiction for kids not smoking is cigarettes. It's amazing. Uh, in conclusion, many studies besides mine, of course, are of, poor, are of very poor quality due to problems in methodology, interpretation, presentation, subsequent, of course, media campaigns and media frenzy and headlines. The e-cigarette is a field generating huge publicity, and you know, both universities and professors like this publicity, so they provoke this publicity. We are seeing cell studies of having almost no relevance to human effects getting to the headlines. Uh, presented as if they were examining human effects. For example, a latest study which found some protein changes in, uh, in lung epithelial cells said that e-cigarettes cause us emphysema. Well, emphysema, there are so many different complex mechanisms which eventually lead to emphysema, which is impossible to define that e-cigarettes are going to cause emphysema based on some protein changes in a, in a cell culture. It's impossible. And I think that there are two reasons for this phenomenon. One is the lack of understanding about the e-cigarette complexity, mode of function, patterns of use. It's much more complicated than smoking. So I genuinely believe that some people don't even understand how they work. And of course, there is the ideological opposition towards anything beyond complete cessation of smoking without using any alternative, and of course, without using nicotine. But I'm not sure which one of the two is worse, and in many cases, both are present. So thank you very much. I, I, I invite you to follow my blog. You can sign on a newsletter, and you can read all the news about research. <laughs> thank you, Konstantinos, for almost keeping in time. That's, that's great, yeah.
I mean, the title of your talk was Pitfalls in E-Cigarette Research. It's the wrong title. It's Stupidity in E-Cigarette yeah. Research, except yours, of course. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> so are there any questions for Konstantinos? Yes, please. I'm just wondering which liquids have been used and how many in each study. You mentioned one study only had 30 liquids, and there's a hundred of thousands of liquids on the market. Well, so for me, already the fact that the number of liquids used is very low doesn't make any study statistically significant to generalize. For well, the yeah, market. but uh, you know, the, just because there is so much variability of device and liquids, as you said, there are thousands, millions of combinations. It's impossible in the research area to evaluate everything. So what you can do is you either use standardized liquids, which may be something that you create on the lab, which are unflavored, using only basic ingredients, or you may use something on the market. But you know, with having so much, as you said, thousands of liquids, in, a, in the research field, it's impossible to do anything to test all these things. I mean, you need huge funds, huge amounts of money, large amounts of people. So you are basically, you have to choose something and do and expect that the results are going to be similar whatever liquid you use. Yes, thank you for your talk. It's a general comment, actually. I have been like working in public health more than 25, 15 years in tobacco control. Actually, never been ever seen such kind of conference was promoted for smoking, if somebody agree with me with e-cigarette smoking or no. People allowed to smoke in this hall or outside there is other people is not smoking actually thus bother us so i think from from the organizer as respect for other people who is not smoke should not allow smoking e-cigarette this is good promotion for the e-cigarette actually and for tobacco product and should be this stopped actually because this bother us who are, are not smoker i am sitting here i'm standing now the guy who's my colleague who's behind, uh, clothing to me is fab in my face, actually. This is not acceptable at all. I don't know after 10, 15 years, we'll be facing the same thing with tobacco company, where they show us all this evidence that is good, the smoking, and after that, we'll be 15 years, we'll be sure e cigarette is worse for, other, for our health than what happened for tobacco. So I don't know after 10, 15 years, what will be happening. If this, all this research, I mean, made by the tobacco company is biased study, or is good things, just to promote it for the people as alternative tobacco company, but it alternative e-cigarette instead of tobacco? I don't know what happened, actually. Okay, you, ha you have to remember that the e-cigarette was neither invented nor, uh, na nor first marketed by the big tobacco. The big tobacco was the, were the last who entered the e-cigarette market. So I, I understand your conservations, and I'm always very cautious also when we are talking about the big tobacco. But the big tobacco entered the e-cigarette in the last couple of years. Before that, they were basically laughing at the e-cigarette. The e-cigarette, as I said, was a consumer-initiated and consumer-driven product. It was not a big corporation driven. And you have to remember that before the introduction of the big tobacco companies into the market, there was basically no marketing of e-cigarettes. There was only one, I could say, big company in the US who did some kind of marketing, but all over the world, the, the whole promotion of e-cigarettes went from smokers who used them, convincing other smokers to go and try it. There was absolutely no marketing. Of course, this has changed over the past two years. So I think that making the comparison with what happened with smoking is first of all not fair and not proportionate. Second of all, I don't care what the big tobacco industry says. I can only look at the evidence, and most of the evidence has been produced by myself and I have never been funded by any big tobacco company. And uh, looking at the evidence, not by myself, but also by many others, I think we can use common sense and say what we can expect. Of course, I agree with you. We don't know what will happen in 15 years. But that's not a reason to say, OK, let's ban it because we don't know what happens. When a new antihypertensive is developed and is introduced into the market, an antihypertensive medication, there are no studies of what's happening if you take this pill for 30 years. But there will be a lot of patients who are going to take it for 30 years. So you do some studies, you watch, you have some expectations, and then you do post-marketing monitoring. And of course, this is exactly what we need to do with this cigarette. Continuously monitor the use post-market for many years to understand eventually and to be accurately quantify the effect on health compared to smoking. May I comment on this? First of all, it's a terminology. Nobody is smoking here. 
but it's vaping. It's very different from smoking. I think this has been explained here. And the other thing is the accusation of bias studies. I mean, I'm a scientist myself. I've been a scientist for 35 years. And we are all, when we are doing research, we need our money from somewhere. And to accuse people, what you are doing, you're accusing the colleagues here, just because they are from the tobacco industry, to, let's, to publish fake studies. To, that's an accusation of cheating. Actually, I would consider a legal, legal action against you because we need our money and I get my money from industry, I get it from, from the government and from wherever. But they never ever will tell me what I have to publish. And an accusation that the colleagues who presented here probably uh, showed us fake data on exhalation. This is a very severe accusation. It's always, you know when it, when it comes? It comes when the scientific arguments are missing. I have two groups of opponents in my life. One is the esoteric pseudoscience in, 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 the, in health, like homeopathy and so on, and more, this has been for 20 years. More recently, it's, the, it's a tobacco control. And in both cases, I'm, I'm confronted with, with personal ad hominem arguments when the science is missing. This is in homeopathy, they tell me I'm, 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 uh, I'm from, the debate, from the pharmaceutical industry, and when I, when I fight for e-cigarettes, they tell me I'm from an hallucinated electronic cigarette lobby. In the, both cases, I'm biased. I'm not biased at all. I'm a scientist, I think the colleagues who presented are scientists here, and they have the trust. Show, show, show me any data that would prove that they have, have not, not properly, properly done their studies. It's an accusation that I don't accept. I, 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 I need to note something. Uh, we have to, I mean, the audience has to respect if someone doesn't want to be exposed to the aerosol, the vapor from any cigarette. So please, if someone uh, is annoyed, he has to inform and you have to inform your, your, uh, your, 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 the guy or the woman sitting next to you. And we need to respect when someone tells a, a vapor that I don't want to be exposed. For my personal reasons, it doesn't matter. You don't need to, to open a scientific deba debate. But we have to respect uh, his uh, asking of not to be exposed. So please, if someone is annoyed, we have to respect him. Yeah, that's fully agree. Yeah. So any...